very uh, happy and honored to introduce Fiona Sanders. And um, I guess the um, I'm very um, happy in particular that I can connect all the whales society together <laughs> because of, obviously they don't know about it. That. <laughs> this is an opportunity to see that down the street, you're just three hours away, right? Yeah. Swansea. Yeah. Uh, there is good work happening. And I think that um, there have been a lot of patterns and this is focused on packing, but there's been a lot of patterns and we just well, today patterns are everywhere. And the owner's work is really is, is, a, is about patterns in granular materials or in general patterns. So it's going to um, um, amaze you, I think, with uh, some really interesting patterns. That, and there's a lot of packing, I suppose, inside, but I don't think some, some packing. Yeah. packing. Yeah. yeah, and you're going to, yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy, the owner, and Thank looking you. forward to it. So I'll give you a sign of five, five minutes. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much for the invite. So it's uh, great to be here. It's been a treat. Uh, so I am from Swansea, right? So we do a little geography first. So we are in Aberystwyth, which is like up here. And Swansea, where I'm now from, is down here. So it's like a two hour drive. It depends how many, how many tractors are on the road. It takes a bit longer usually. <laughs> but uh, it's a shorter drive down there. And this is our campus. So this is a new Bay campus that was built in like 2015. Uh, and this was before Brexit. So the EU paid for all of that. So that was good. <laughs> and we have a you know, good supply of sand uh, for our granular materials uh, just by there. So it's a good place uh, to be. Okay. Right. So this talk is not so much about the packing, but we'll see if there's opportunities to think about that as we go along, I suppose. Uh, we will be talking about pattern formation and pattern formation in a system that is a granular material, uh, which is submerged in a fluid. Um, so we're going to take a Hellerschel cell, which is two glass plates that we sandwich on top of one another. There's like a 2D cell with a gap in between. Into this gap, we're going to uh, fill our defending fluid. So there's going to be fluid number one. It's a defending fluid. Uh, that's going to contain the granular materials. Now, this fluid could be water, and we could just have like glass beads as like a model system for granular material uh, in that fluid. Um, these grains are going to be loose, so a very loose uh, packing. Uh, into that system, we are going to pump the second fluid, which is an invading fluid here. And we're just going to, yep. They're loose under gravity, so they yep. flapping at the bottom and there's water on the top. Or... Yeah, that's exactly right. So we are not density matching the grains to the fluid. Uh, we take the syringe, we take the glass beads in water. We shake it really fast and pump it in as fast as we can, so it kind of remains in suspension. And then once in the Hellerschau cell, uh, the grains will sediment out, and they will form a layer on the bottom cell. And our filling level is kind of the ratio of the height of this layer of grains to the thickness of the gap in the cell. So when I talk about the filling level, I'm talking about this uh, phi here, which can be one if the cell is completely full of grains. At that point, it's like we are in a porous media type situation. If the cell is so full of grains that the grains can't move, then this is a static porous media. And we're kind of back to the uh, two-phase flow in porous media type of physics at that point. Uh, if we go to the other extreme, then my filling level is so low that I forgot to put any beads into it. At that point, we just have two fluids. So then we're kind of back to a fluid-fluid displacement type problem. But, and both of these kind of extremes are well known in terms of the physics of it, or a lot of it, uh, still active research, obviously. Uh, but the kind of novelty of what I'm showing you is the fact that these are loose grains, it's just a loose granular material uh, that can be pushed around by the fluids. Uh, they can be pushed around by the viscosity of the fluid, by viscous forces, or 
uh, in our experiment, which we are going to do now, we are going to inject the invading fluid. It's going to come down here, and it's going to start to push away uh, this mixture that we put in there. Uh, and uh, the grains are going to be wetted to the defending fluid. So the meniscus is going to push the grains away from the invading phase. And that's going to be the same in all the experiments that I show you. Uh, and I'll show you more of that later. Yeah. So we are in the situation where uh, in what's called drainage, where the grains are uh, wetted to the defending fluid. Um, and we are going to manipulate like the injection rate, the viscosity of the fluids, uh, and the filling level of the grains. That's going to be our experimental parameters. Yeah. The invading fluid has a lower or higher density than the... Oh, the density. Oh, uh, the density. So does it when it goes in, or does it... Uh, uh, that what we're going to see is going to see an effect uh, which we call capillary bulldozing, where okay. actually the invading fluid is going to, just going to push the stuff away, so create a clear channel. So the density. So is the invading fluid uh, likes, well, the, to wet the, wet, likes to wet the top and bottom plates? Uh, actually, that's a good, like uh, when we're fine tuning the experiment, we're trying to make it either neutrally wetting okay. or, or, yeah, it's not it's big. Sure uh, the whole filling height. Yeah. So the gap in the cell is like smaller than the capillary length okay. of the fluid uh, of the meniscus. So we're going to get this effect that yeah. we are going to show. But kind of the, the point of my talk here is to compare the viscosities. Mm. So we have the invading fluid and the defending fluid. Uh, what happens when the defending fluid has a higher viscosity? And what happens when we switch these two things around? That's going to be the, the point. So um, that's where we are. But, you know, yeah. So we can manipulate the filling fraction here. Um, and before we put the grains in, let's just kind of see what happens in the classical fluid-fluid displacement process. So if we take all the grains out of the system, we're just left with two fluids, the defending fluid, the invading fluid. If the invading fluid is lower viscosity than the defending fluid, the interface becomes unstable. So this is the classic safman taylor instability. So it's viscously unstable this system. And that is because the pressure gradient is localized in the high viscosity fluid, which is here the defending fluid that's already in the cell. And, and, so, and, and the rate won't have any effect on that? The rate has a big effect on that. If you're, doing, if you're pumping in the, um, the fluid very, very slowly, you don't see that kind of effect of the viscous fingering kicking in. you got to have a, a capillary number or a, a viscous uh, effect that takes you over a threshold where the viscous forces start to become uh, noticeable. And that's when we get this viscous fingering effect. So that's kind of also important for what we will discuss uh, later on. So the, the instability here is because the pressure localizes within the high viscosity fluid, which is what's in the blue here. So this is glycerol and we're injecting water. The yellow fluid is water with a food dye in it that is going into high viscous glycerol uh, fluid, and hence we get this uh, this effect, right? And the pressure gradient is here, so the closer a finger gets to the edge, the steeper that pressure gradient becomes, and it will accelerate and accelerate. So it's a positive feedback loop which causes an undulation in an otherwise straight interface to become in unstable and grow into a finger. So this is viscous, uh, is viscously unstable, this uh, situation. Now we're going to compare a viscously unstable situation to a viscously stable situation, right? Uh, what happens if we inject the high viscosity fluid into the low viscosity fluid is very boring because at this point, the interface is stable and it will just expand like a disc if it's like a radially symmetric system like this. So there's no, pat there's no mechanism for pattern formation in the system. You just get an expanding uh, disc like this. So that's when it's just two fluids. 
Uh, if we go to the other kind of well-known situation, which is a porous medium, it looks kind of similar to this. We get uh, viscous fingering in a porous medium, uh, but the interface gets a bit scraggly because you have the disorder in the porous medium that kind of breaks up that smooth interface. Uh, now, if you take a porous medium and you lower the injection rate, you lower the viscous forces, you get to a point where uh, actually what's controlling the displacement is the disorder in the pore sizes, in the porous uh, medium. So you get uh, invasion percolation, where the interface just goes into the largest uh, pores uh, that it can see. And in that way, it creates like a fractal invasion percolation uh, structure. So we have a pattern formation in a porous medium, which creates these fractals at low uh, injection rate uh, that transitions to uh, viscous fingering in porous media, also at high. Um, injection rate or, you know, capillary number. Okay, so now we are going to put our loose granular material into this situation and see what we can see, right? Um, so the thing that's going to happen is that now we have loose granular material that we can push around. Well, that's going to introduce a new force, and that is just a friction that the grains are resisting that motion with. So now kind of what's interesting to us in this new system is to look at uh, this competition between these forces. The, on the one hand, we have the meniscus between these two. You know, if it's air that's going into water, there's the air uh, water meniscus that could push the grains by capillary forces. And remember, we are in drainage. So the grains are going to be repelled by water, uh, by the air. They like to stay in the defending fluid here, right? So that's going to happen. In that case, we could be interested in the you know, surface tension or the capillary uh, forces relative to the friction. And obviously, surface tension forces need to be, they need to overcome the friction to be able to push the grains. So that's uh, number one. We are going to be interested in a situation where that always happens, right? So we are in, um, anyway, I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, but secondly, we are interested then in the viscous forces relative to uh, this friction. And the viscous forces are, well, we can in, you know, increase the viscous forces by pumping faster. So we can in, increase the injection rate, Q. So that's one of our parameters. Uh, or we can increase the viscosities of the fluid. So that's our eta here. Okay, so that's how we manipulate the viscous forces in the experiment. Um, the frictional forces we manipulate by increasing or decreasing this filling fraction of grains. So the more grains in the system, the more friction for the same amount of displacement, right? And as we've said, the thing that we are kind of interested in here, the point of this talk is to compare this viscously unstable system where we, let's say, injecting air into water or glycerol, compare that to what if we swap that around and we're now injecting the high viscosity fluid into a lower viscosity fluid, right? So the first part is kind of old news. That was like Australia type old uh, news. Uh, but the other thing is uh, like a more recent uh, thing. So I'll but I'll show you the old stuff first and then I'll show you the new stuff and then we can compare. Okay, so the fact that, uh, okay, now we're going to, we are interested in the viscous forces. That's kind of the main point, but let's first look at the situation where we're doing it so slowly that we can neglect the viscous forces. Now we're left with the meniscus, so surface tension, and we're left with the frictional forces of the grains. Those are the only two forces that are kind of active in the system. And we've said that we are going to have a situation where the meniscus is actually able to push the grains. So if we imagine our, we're looking into a cross section of between these two plates, what we're going to get is a capillary bulldozing effect where the meniscus is bulldozing this layer of grains into a compaction branch. And I could, uh, we could think about the packing problems here, like what's a packing in terms of this being a sedimented layer of grains. And now you're going to have this bulldozing effect. Now, 
let's just put that as like an open question. We, we're just going to assume that the packing is the same in those two uh, in those two spaces. We're just going to say that the filling fraction is like one, where it's kind of compacted, right? But that is a approximation to write our back of the envelope type uh, equations. But the main point here, we're going to get our invading fluids pushing on the meniscus. The meniscus is going to build those up grains. Those grains are uh, in that compaction front. That compaction front has a thickness or a length L. And the more grains we accumulate, the higher the friction is going to be that we have to overcome to push this stuff. And we could have force chains and all sorts of things going through this packing here which means it could get uh, complicated. And if we do, then we could say that we get an increased uh, normal force. Let's call that sigma ZZ, which is kind of proportional to the you know, horizontal stress that we are pushing with the meniscus on. And the simplest model here would be to say that these are uh, proportional. So this is the Janssen law, which just says that uh, uh, you know, in our case, the vertical stress is just proportional to the horizontal stress that we are imposing on the packing. In that case, uh, we can solve for the friction, and the thicker it becomes, the stress you have to apply to move it grows exponentially with this uh, thickness in that case. Here's a simulation by Benji Marks, who we know, some of us. Uh, this is a DN, and we are now kind of in the reference frame of the meniscus here. The meniscus being played by a wall that is now uh, static, and the two uh, walls up and down are being moved towards the static walls. And here you can see the compaction happening in a 2D system, where to start with, you have the sedimented layer becoming bulldozed up uh, by this meniscus as it moves in. So this is in 1D. Now in 1D, the grains have got nowhere to go. So the thickness of this compaction front is just going to grow and grow and grow. And if the uh, friction increases exponentially, that's going to be very hard. It's jamming up in that tube, right? Uh, but we are not in 1D. We are in 2D. In fact, we are in a hellishal cell. So this is uh, a camera placed underneath a horizontal cell. And we are looking up at the air, fingers of air coming in, displacing that uh, grain uh, uh, water uh, glycerol mixture that is a kind of the golden color here. The golden color is because of the, the grains, essentially, the color of the grains. So uh, we have an instability here. We have a pattern forming pro, uh, mechanism, even though we are at very low injection rates. Remember, we this is like slow drying out. This is taking two days to do a time lapse. Yeah, just a picture. Is is the white stuff uh, real? I mean, is it from the picture? I mean, this is direct out of the camera. It's a time lapse uh, from from a camera yeah, underneath. So what's make the like the, the the white? What is it? So uh, now we now the experiment is finished. We have drained. So we start with a uh, with uh, uh, the grains in the fluids. And we pushed it, it's a disc when we start, yeah. right? because uh, when, when I inject it, let's see if we can start again. When I inject it, it's viscously stable, so it just forms this disc. But now I'm pumping out very slowly from the middle here. So you can see the tube coming out here. So I'm withdrawing fluid very slowly through this uh, hole. And then it starts to contract, and the air comes in from the edge. So that is now the invading fluid coming in from the edge here. Mm -hmm. And we have this meniscus that is starting to bulldoze these grains. And it starts to form this compaction front, which we can see. Uh, let's run it a bit further. Let's put it here. So you can see the golden color here. This is that compaction front mm -hmm. yeah, that has formed in front of this okay. uh, meniscus, right? Um, the reason this is now unstable is because if you just keep a bulldozer, you know, in Norway we got snow, and so we know that we have to shape the snow plow to push the snow to the side, right? You can't push the snow all the way down the road. That wouldn't uh, be very uh, smart. And the thing here knows it as well, right? It's creating a plow 
to plow the material to the side because then it can doesn't have to move the grains so far right if it was to just go straight forward and forward forward it would you know accumulate a huge amount of grains which would be very frictionally expensive to push around so the finger here the pattern formation the instability uh, arrives at a, a balance where it shapes itself in such a way as to push the grains to plow them to the side at the front but you know if friction was the only thing operating here you would move less grains by making that finger very thin just a little needle going through would push your grains just a tiny bit right but that would cost a lot in terms of the curvature of the finger pair. So that's the other cost in the system. So we get the characteristic length scale, which is the separation uh, between these uh, between these uh, fingers that is set up by the competition between the friction and the surface tension, uh, these two forces that we've got, right? Uh, okay. I just so uh, the water drain out. No particles come out. Yeah, so we're doing that's kind of the point of the experiment to do it so slowly that we don't have any viscous uh, rearrangement. A filter or something on the drain. Uh, 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 now, so let's stop it here. Um, it's so slow, like it's drying out essentially, yeah. but with a constant drying rate. So the particles aren't moved, but when the fingers move around that outlet hole, we've got to suck the water through these branches. So that becomes a very high pressure you know, to get to this. So that's why I have to do it so slow. And then just like moving a little bit of water at a time to drain the whole thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that was maybe my, you know, my question was, so these white boundaries are like five equals one. Yeah. But yeah. There's two, like, what's the depth sort of in the tubes and these little regions that seem like you have these, uh, you, you, know, you the, mean the like gold fingers, right? That now have these little rounded edges. Oh, yeah, that is not fully things. drained here. Yeah, but yeah. Then this stays at the original depth of five. Uh, you have to imagine that here's the interface. It has compacted up this much material, but it's a bulldozer. So anything that is yeah. beyond the bulldozer is undisturbed. Actually, there's these like little channels that so you the get, original depth yeah. that train out. And you can see here that um, that the labyrinth is uh, um, okay. Here's a final picture. So I drained it now completely. I left it so long that everything's drained. Now those branches are the compaction fronts of two fingers that have met and pushed their compaction fronts together. And that is now a wall of granular material uh, in, in, the, in the thing, mm -hmm. okay? So we can talk about compactness of the thing. And this is now completely compact and space filling in terms of a pattern because we've, well, we forced it to drain the entire area, right? So oh, uh, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can um, locate any isolated branch so there's no instability that can snap off. Yeah, so they are protected from snapping off because uh, they have this compaction front, right? So when they meet, they're going to push the compaction fronts together. And that's now, you can't move it anymore. That's now jammed. Yeah. Five, five is equal, equal to one. one. And if you're going to penetrate this thing, you have to go into the pore space. So actually there is we started with a circle right this is still a circle it's just been stretched to fill the space in this uh, weird not uh, i don't know how gordian this is but uh, <laughs> and, uh yeah. can you do this when we have one initial entry so you just have uh, a lot yeah experimentally it's kind of difficult but in our in our um, in our uh, simulations there yeah, we, we get the one entry point creating this uh, branch structure uh, and then we've done other things where we look at the diffusion through this kind of landscape created by these you know, things. But that's kind of a separate, but yeah, it's interesting kind of geometrically, uh, I suppose. But yeah, you, it's a labyrinth in the sense that you can walk. You know, if you want to get out of a labyrinth, put your hand on the wall. It's not the fastest way out of the labyrinth, but because there's been no snapping off, you will get to the exit uh, at some point.
All right. Uh, this is just to show that that was fully drained. Here we are injecting the air. We're still in the viscously unstable, but it doesn't matter because we're doing it so slow that viscous forces are not important. So hence just friction and surface tension. Here, uh, we're not uh, forcing it to drain fully. So therefore it's, it's not a compact filling of this pattern, if you like. So you could think you could be interested in what is the, it's almost like a self-avoiding random walk type thing where, the, where it can expand along any part of the interface. So that could be interesting to look at. Uh, anyway, I said this already. We get a characteristic length scale, which is the width of these fingers here uh, that are given by this uh, competition between the surface tension and the uh, frictional stress. Right? So there is a total stress that the fluid needs to overcome, you know, get higher than to be able to push against friction and against surface tension, which is then inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of that finger. So at any point along the interface, uh, as we keep ramp pumping, it's gonna ask where is the minimum, where's the smallest yield pressure? That's where we're gonna push it first. So the system uh, naturally just minimizes the work uh, rate in the system. And that is what corresponds to this uh, emergent length scale, which is the thing with. And, you know, so we just set uh, the derivative of the, that yield pressure against your width of your finger is equal to zero. So we get a very simple expression for the finger width. So if we increase the surface tension, they're gonna get wider because surface tension doesn't like to have these curved fingers. If we increase uh, friction or the filling fraction, well, the fingers are gonna get narrower because now it has to push more mass for the same amount of width and that costs more in terms of its friction, right? And we can do, We've done, we've repeated this trick on so many things now, but it's always uh, the same. Uh, I don't think we might not have time to discuss it, but we are going to use a very simple friction law at the tip. So remember this, that uh, the width of the fingers are set at the growing tip. So we're gonna be interested in the friction at the growing tip because that's a uh, finger width but we're going to be interested in when it breaks out the new finger and then we're interested in the friction of the side wall which is different so that's going to be a point to later all right um we are discussing kind of the the role of filling fraction because we're increasing the friction by doing so we said already that if we go to phi is equal to zero we get just two fluids and if we go all the way up here is equal to one, we essentially have a porous media because the grains become fixed in place, they got nowhere to go, completely packed. Now uh, there is an interesting thing, and this is like a side note, we are interested in the fingers in this talk, but I'll just show you that this other pattern we get, which are like fractures, when the filling fraction is like almost fully packed, you actually put the cell up right and just drizzle the grains very gently, so they sediment out into the cell, and then we put the cell very carefully horizontal, so we got the loosest possible packing to begin with. And now we inject the air and then you see we got this fracture pattern. So now it is actually those, that air finger is like needle thin. It is kind of controlled by the, um, by the, by the pore, pore size really. So, but just to show you that there's still a local compaction thing going on here. So we got the fracture coming in and you can see it doesn't play very well, but you can see it's like pushing locally. It's compacting the material. And if we do particle image velocimetry, we can kind of quantify. And we can see that this compaction happens locally and further away. You know, so we've got all the arrows close to the thing and further away, it's not moving. So that means it is become compacted by, by this fracturing. And this is just like a cartoon. But these fractures are still kept separate then by their compaction fronts because they can't enter into a space that, well, the fractures will always go where it's easier to go. Everything goes where it's easier to go. And it's always easier to go where it's not compacted. So it will stay out of each other's compaction uh, areas. So even in this fracturing uh, type uh, system, we still have like a space filling pattern in the end where the fracture branches are, you know, kept apart by each other's uh, compaction props. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so that was failing fraction, and now we're soon to the point where we'll start talking about the viscously unstable system. But uh, so far, I've talked about what the system does when we remove the effects of viscous uh, forces in the system. This has been like slow drying out type processes. Uh, we have had air going into a water glycerol mixture containing the grains. So it's been viscously unstable because we're injecting the uh, low viscosity fluid into the high viscosity fluid. Uh, we've so now let's increase the injection rate and let's see what happens in this system here. And what happens there is that we now get viscous fingers again. So, okay, that's cool. So now we have a viscous instability, but what happened to our frictional instability that created frictional fingers? Well, the grains are inside, they are submerged in the high viscosity fluid, which means it's very, you know, they become uh, fluidized by this flow. The viscous forces by the fluid that they are embedded in is enough to kind of move them around when you start to go to high rate. So actually this system here will turn off the frictional instability when we increase the rate and it will be replaced by a viscous instability. So these are two different pattern forming processes that take it in terms uh, to be active in the system. So that is kind of what we learned from this. So where are we now? We are, uh, we looked at a viscously unstable system where we get viscous fingering. We put grains into it and we've seen that we have uh, still this uh, um, viscous uh, instability happening at the high injection rate or high viscous forces. But we have this frictional instability that takes over uh, when the uh, injection, well, when, when the viscous forces become uh, small, we still have the frictional instability. So what happens now if we were to turn this around? We're going to flip the fluids around. So we're going to inject the water glycerol into air. Now that should be very boring. That should just give us a, an expanding fluid disk. So that's like, nobody's interested in that because there's no instability. All right, but we're going to put our grains into it, our loose grains. So it's going to be viscously stable but frictionally unstable. And let's think about the competition between these two stabilizing, destabilizing mechanisms in the system. And which one is gonna win is our question uh, here. So to be able to do that, now we're gonna have the, we're gonna have the grains in the defending fluid, but the defending fluid is going to be air. But we still want the grains to be wetted by air and to be pushed away by the water that's coming in. So we have to make the grains hydrophobic, right? So we do that. You can see here, this is just like toy, toy beads you can buy in the shop where you, you can see if you pour it into water, it will just cluster and it will prevent water from going into the spaces between the grains. So when you pick it out again, it's still dry, right? Uh, we're going to make a similar, we're going to take the same glass beads that we use, but we're going to make them hydrophobic with a um, chemical treatment, and that's it. So now we've flipped the fluids, but we've also flipped the wetting of the grain. So we're kind of back to where we started. The only difference be being that we've, uh, we've got a viscously stable system. Everything else uh, should be fine. So now, just to reiterate, we're going to have water or water glycerol coming in being the invading fluid. That's gonna push away the hydrophobic grains. And we're still gonna get this compaction front because now the grains are hydrophobic. So that's still the same. Everything's the same except that thing. Okay, and the thing that we are going to be interested in now for the remainder of this talk is the effect of viscous forces. Uh, when, am I, when is my talk finished, by the way? Um, you have about 10 minutes for discussion. Okay. And just ask uh, while we're going. The next okay. talk is kind of all right. Uh, so don't invite. Probably shouldn't say that. Can I have okay. a question seeing as your doctor's got extended? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ask as we go along is better. 
sorry, a, a moment ago you were talking about the very viscous limit where particles are basically suspended in the viscous. Fluid. Yeah. And it, that, you know, you basically have a viscous fluid invading a suspension. Do I understand that correct? Yeah. Correct. So, yeah. So, so because suspensions have their own viscosity in yeah. these Einstein's relation. Does it look like you get the same solutions there as you would if it was just two viscous fluids where one had the suspension viscosity and one? Had yeah. Um, so probably you shouldn't look into our work for the answer to that. You should look into work that was done by Chevalier et al. Even before we did this, they were had um, density matched suspensions. And they could look at viscous fingering intensity match suspensions, and they could see differences because of uh, grains. And one of the difference by having the grains in the system is a because it becomes a, not a Newtonian fluid anymore. This suspension and one of the effects of that is to make the viscous fingers thinner and make them branch more easily. So, okay. so, so it's still yeah. dense enough that it doesn't obey classical suspension geology. Uh, yeah, so the density, the density, yeah, the, the density of our suspensions in that film, if you convert it back to an actual density, is probably like 0.3 or something. So it's, a, it's not in the dense suspension limit of the thing. And probably what makes our system more difficult to say something about is that we start it with a, on a layer. Right. So it kind of acts like a suspension, but it's probably more like sliding this layer out of the thing so rather than mixing. Enough to just look like a, a yeah. new fluid. Yeah, no, but it's definitely it definitely looks uh, <coughs> similar. So yeah, I mean those finger patterns look like the ones you get for two fluids. Yeah, it looks like two fluids, except they're a bit more irregular and yeah. they branch a bit more, and that's kind of the disorder that the grains. Uh, uh, put into the system, that is the difference uh, between that. So, but yeah, kind of it seems like as a fluidization transition when we go to this viscous uh, uh, response, right? Okay, and the kind of point of the remaining is to look at this effect of viscosity. If it's very low injection rate, low viscous forcing, then it doesn't really matter. You could be Viscously stable or unstable doesn't really matter if there's no viscous forces, right? Uh, so let's look at that first. And here's now, so now this is uh, water being injected into dry hydrophobic grains. And we see the same thing happening, right? We see a finger, uh, which is bulldozing up the grains. And that is creating this, uh, sorry, that capillary bulldozing, creating a frictional instability that shapes the interface into this finger. Where the characteristic length again is a finger width determined by the competition between the friction of this compaction front that you built up and the curvature of the finger tail. So that still holds true. Uh, but so here we've got one finger growing at any one time. This is at one milliliter per minute injection rate. So now we're going to increase the viscous forces in the system and see what that does. And if we increase, now we're at 30 milliliters per minute. Now we get this thing happening. So instead of just the one finger growing, we have multiple fingers growing at the same time. And if we do this in small steps, we can go from having one finger to having two fingers, three fingers, you know, we keep in increasing the injection rate and we can just increase the number of active fingers in a reasonably controlled way in the system. So the effect of the uh, increasing the viscous forces in this system is to break out new fingers. Yes. Right. Thinking that there's an ocean in your pump right at the top that becomes disjointed from the rest of the system, right there. Where? Yeah. Even island. Where, yeah. where, where do you see that? Just wait a second. And stop. No, no. stop. There. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Can I stop it? At the very top. Yeah. At the very top. Oh, no. I think. Oh, you think yeah. here? We are seeing the tube through. through. This is just a tube that you're looking at. This is a, a camera on the floor. 
I got the, uh, so here is, is an injection port. To this injection port, I have a pump up there somewhere. And there's a tube uh, coming through here. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> they're not disjointed. I was, uh, I got worried. I was like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in the original experiments, you were pumping out through the sensor? Yes, yeah, so I know it's confusing. We've done different things at different times, but we just keep our mind on what's invading fluid and what's the yeah. defending fluid. And, right. and in this case, uh, we're doing the opposite. So we're yeah. pumping, we're injecting. Yeah. So, so the fronts are kind of moving out instead of in. Yeah, the, the fingers are moving out. There's an issue with compressibility. You know, if you're dealing with air, you have to be careful. If you're pumping on the air, you get other effects completely, which is due to the compressibility of the air. So um, that's bubbles. Uh, that's a whole different uh, story. All right. So, but you see that? That's cool, right? We... Remember, we are now in a viscously stable uh, scenario. If there was only fluids here, what would they want to do? They would want to just create a disk, a fully compact disk, right? So now by increasing, by giving the viscous forces more and more say in the system, it starts to want to create that compact disk going out from the, uh, from the center. But the frictional instability won't let that happen. So the frictional instability is breaking this stuff, the fluid up into fingers. Uh, and now there's like a competition between these two things happening at the same time. But the more we increase the viscous forces in the system, the effect becomes to break up more and more fingers, as we shall see. All right, but we want to be able to, so if the main observable here is that we get an increasing number of, of uh, fingers growing by increasing the viscous forces. Can we kind of put together a back of the envelope type model for that? And so what's now going on here is that these fingers become kind of pipes for the fluid to flow through to get to the tip of the finger where it's actually expanding, where it's actually growing, right? So at the tip of the finger, we still just have our uh, surface tension and friction. But if you, that's like the end of the pipe. Right, that's that's what you're left with there. But if you walk backwards towards the flow, the pressure in the fluid is going to go up and up and up because of the viscous pressure gradient through this flowing uh, pipe. If the fluid is standing still, there's no pre so viscous pressure gradient. But if it's expanding in the tip, then yes, we have the flow. So now the question is, how do we break out the new finger? Well, a finger has, whoops. A finger has this compaction front around it, right? But as we go backwards, we see that the fluid pressure keeps going up and up and up. So the question becomes, when is the fluid pressure going to be enough to break out a new finger? So we need to break out of the sidewall to create a new finger. So it's a competition between the viscous pressure inside the finger. And when does that become strong enough to actually burst through the burst through the walls at the side. Okay, now the viscous uh, pressure is just given by Darcy's law. So if we take the injected flow rate, and two, well, two R is just, a, you know, R is the length or the, the width of the finger, so two R is the width, and B is the thickness, that's the cross section, right? And if we have N number of fingers, if we have Two fingers, well, the velocity becomes, we have to divide it by the number of fingers that we have actively growing, right? Um, so we have a viscous pressure, delta PV, given by Darcy's law, like this. Uh, so the question is, when is that com of comparable size to the frictional uh, strength of the wall? And that's how we're going to essentially define our uh, dimensionless uh, viscous deformability as the ratio between the viscous pressure in the system and the frictional strength. So we're going to take this viscous pressure defined by um, Darcy's law, compare that to the friction. Um, we are going to say that this number is equal to one if the system can make a finger that gets all the way to the edge of the cell before it breaks out the new finger. So it's like a system size uh, dependency to that. But really, this is just the viscous pressure and this is the frictional pressure. 
okay? And we know how much, so if the finger needs to become a length delta RB, if that's how long it takes to build up enough pressure to break out a new finger, and that is the corresponding viscous pressure, then we know that the volume that we need to inject to create that length of finger is the cross-sectional area by the length of that finger. So for each volume that we inject that is enough to break out a new finger, this delta N is going to count up by one. So we want to predict this number of fingers as a function of the injected volume. Right? We just integrate that up. And here's all our measurements. So N, number of fingers, it grows with the injected volume because we need to have a certain length to build up the pressure to break out the wall. And the longer the finger, the higher pressure at the pump, kind of. Uh, if we increase the injection rate, we are increasing the gradient, the fluid pressure gradient of the flow because it's having to flow faster. So we're gonna get more fingers because it doesn't take as long a distance to break out a new finger because the gradient is higher. Um, and another result here is that if we take this curve, which is at filling fraction 0.42, and we increase the filling fraction, remember it's the friction of the sidewalls we have to overcome. And by increasing the filling fraction, increasing the amount of grains, well, that's gonna make the wall stronger. So that's gonna suppress the growth of new fingers. So the new fingers, amount of new fingers is going to go down, okay? Um, so here we have the number of fingers is proportional to the volume injected because a longer distance creates a higher pressure in the inlet. It's, uh, remember this one is proportional to the viscosity times the injection rate, the viscous forces, divided by this uh, frictional uh, strength. So it all checks out, but this one here is the only unknown. This is, so we fit all of these and we find that if we plot what it needs to be as a function of this uh, thickness of the compaction front, that it is indeed growing exponentially. So the thicker the wall is, the pressure we need to have to break out grows exponentially. So this is a log lin. A plot there. So we feel comfortable with this model for our sidewall friction in this case. So now everything checks out that we got this model that uh, does all of those things. And we don't get exactly like, this is a very, um, you know, this is pattern formation. We don't get the data collapse as such because of the variability, but it's like a data gathering at least uh, that follows the trend that we have outlined. And that's the main uh, point of this. Uh, we do simulations, I won't talk about them, except to show that we can reproduce this effect. Here's like multiple fingers growing at the same time. But what we've seen so far is that we can go from one finger to two to three. So there's a one finger scenario, there's a multiple fingers scenario. And now that was like with water, we had run out of steam. That was with water as fast as the pump could go, but now we're gonna push glycerol into it as fast as the pump can go. So now we really, by, you know, it doesn't matter, we can increase the injection rate or the viscosity. Both of those things uh, is a product of the two, right? So it doesn't matter which one we increase. And now we are running this thing as fast and as hard as we possibly can. And now you can really see that the viscous forces now are really wanting to create that compact disc, okay? But now the grains have something to say about it because the grains are submerged in the low viscosity fluid in air. And that is now very hard to fluidize, right? So the frictional instability remains in the system. So that's the kind of, saying the two things that happen here is that yes, we do get a viscous stabilization happening. What viscous stabilization does in the system is to break up more and more fingers until we get a fully compact spoke pattern where uh, you know, the fingers are going side by side uh, and 
where this uh, frictional instability creates the fingers. And as the outer perimeter expands, it has to break up new fingers to maintain this uh, characteristic length scale of the, you know, the finger width. So we get an expanding number of fingers as the thing expands. And the simulations did this out of the box, which was surprising. And we can make a face diagram, uh, and I'm gonna hurry up now. So it's just the viscosity on the y-axis and the injection rate on our Q. We can make um, two criteria. We can get one single finger that gets to the edge if we allow uh, the, the breakout length to be the same as the system size. And we set our n is equal to one. Well, that's our definition for the viscous deformability. So, uh, so this blue line here is viscous deformability is equal to one. Uh, when we get a spoke pattern, what is a spoke pattern? A spoke pattern is where the viscous st uh, stabilization mechanism is acting on the length scale of the fingers. So if we're breaking out a new finger on the length scale of the finger width, then they're all similar size. So that becomes a criterion for uh, this one here. And here's what happens when we increase the filling fraction. And here's kind of our conclusion then in terms of what happens when we move up this axis is that we are increasing the viscous forces either by injection rate or viscosity. It will take us from one to multiple to spoke pattern uh, through transitions by having the viscous stabilization effect acting on the system. All the time, frictional instability is active, right? If we increase the in, uh, filling fraction in the system, we are increasing the wall strength. So it becomes harder and harder to break out new uh, fingers. So we can actually go from uh, more, you know, that will kind of break up, that will act against the viscous stabilization effect. So we can actually get fewer and fewer fingers by moving uh, to the right on that. So those two things are in competition. Okay, I'll leave it there. Obviously, that that raised many questions, which is absolutely great. Um, yes. Yeah, about the simulation that you show next to the real one. Yeah. It's so uh, it never that much. Maybe maybe a little quicker. Mm -hmm. The apparent that was similar. I think the simulation one was kind of creating this, not the, the other simulation. Oh, the other one, yeah. yeah. This one. This one. Well, it just so that it adds the, the real one, yeah, the fingers are going at the same time, but that one. The simulation, you see, there are four fingers, and then it creates the, the fifth one. And the one, two, three, four, and. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, see how the fifth one is coming out. This one, that comes yeah. from that. Yeah. yeah. But that's, it, I think the experiment is more yeah, going yeah. over and just adds later. Yeah. It, it's kind of uh, true that, like, the, the logical thing here is that uh, the viscous stabilization should break out fingers closer to the inlet, right? That's where the pressure is highest. But on top of that, you have to remember that these fingers are going round bands just naturally. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a lot easier to break out a new finger where it's already bending. So we have a very big kind of allowance for this being a pattern forming system with huge variability in it. So this, uh, but you're right. In the, and that's kind of a difference in the simulation is kind of more well behaved in this way. Yeah. Um, well, there are some other things that are not the same in the simulations. In the simulations, we only have one friction model, which is this exponential friction model. But what we kind of learned from this, which remember we talked about in Australia, is that it's weird because the fingertips looks like it's controlled by linear friction, you know, from the experimental data. And, but everything else is telling us that it should be exponential. Well, we've actually realized that the wall friction is exponential because to break out of a straight side wall, you have to dilate the material. And that creates like a high, uh, you know, amount of friction and this, uh, you know, force chains and all of that good stuff that gives you this exponential friction. But at the fingertip, 
what you're doing, you're stretching the grains all the time. You're moving forward and you're accumulating grains, but you're stretching them. So you're kind of breaking up the force chains laterally as you go along. So it's not so well supported sideways. So that gives us a more linear friction with that mass valve. So the subtleties, so, and we have to calibrate the simulations to work across orders of magnitude of viscous forces and everything else, which means it's like a happy medium. Uh, but we have to balance how right it gets the finger width and how right it gets the breaking out um, propensity. So, okay. well, yeah, what well, is simulation? Is it like? Model like an ODPD model, or so it's like a homemade uh, thing. Uh, the way it works, it starts uh, if we forget about the viscous forces, it's only the interface that is interesting. So, you, you have a chain of nodes that go all the way around and describe the interface. When you move this chain of nodes, you're going to accumulate material. So, that's the two things that's. So if you're on not one node and you know how much material is ahead of you, you know how much friction. And if you know the position of your neighbors, you know the local curvature. So that's fine. Uh, that can do all the labyrinth uh, stuff uh, to get the viscous thing in. We skeletonize the fingers. And that's what you see in this one here. So it's a skeleton that runs along the fingers and then we just Darcy flow uh, through that. And that's how we build up uh, viscous pressure. And there is no rate naturally in this simulation. It's just that whenever things are moving at the tip, we know that there's a certain volume there that we have to replace by a flow uh, through this uh, thing. And it's simple. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. I mean, we did have lots of questions during. Uh, the time to let us leave the governor in peace. <laughs> it was wonderful. So thanks so much for your yeah, Thank you.